Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Collecting in a Crisis, a guide to rescuing business records. And um, I'm Victoria Brown from the Scottish Council on Archives. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to be working in partnership with the Business Archives Council for Scotland um, to bring you a really great lineup of speakers. <laughs> um, it is an unfortunate reality of the, the economic situation that we find ourselves in, that there are many more business records at risk. Um, but on a positive note, we're really grateful to the Business Archives Council for developing this guidance and putting to together today's programme. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Chris Castles, uh, the Business Archives Surveying Officer. Um, and yeah, Chris is going to, to talk a bit about the guidance that's been developed. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm going to share some slides, if that's okay. Um, I'll just... Okay, as we're, we're kind of doing the technical issues, I'll just, um, I'll just make a, a start. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thanks very much to the SCA and to, to Victoria and, and, and Robert for um, hosting um, today's webinar. Um, before I kind of uh, do the introductions of the speakers and, and talk a little bit about the guidance, I just want to go through um, very briefly some housekeeping. So um, we've got three speakers um, this afternoon. Um, there will be time for, for questions, hopefully after each um, presentation. Um, and if you have a question, um, if you wouldn't mind, if you put it into the Q&A function um, within Zoom, so that's just at the, at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, and what I'll do is I'll keep an eye on the questions as they're coming in. And then once each speaker has finished um, their presentation, I um, we'll, we'll kind of uh, go through them and hopefully we can, we can get through as many um, questions as, as possible. Um, so, um, thank you very much everyone for coming um, this afternoon. Um, we have uh, three speakers um, who hopefully um, will provide a, a, a kind of very broad um, perspective to, to the question of um, collecting um, business records in the crisis. Um, so we have, um, from a kind of academic pers perspective, um, from the archivist perspective, and then from, from an outside perspective. But I'll, I'll introduce each speaker um, as and when um, they're, they're due to speak. Um, in terms of the guidance that's been produced, um, as Victoria mentioned, um, we are obviously entering um, into a difficult economic situation. Um, the COVID crisis has had um, an enormous impact um, on the economy, not just in the UK, but, but globally. Um, we also have um, Brexit on the horizon, um, which is due to, to, to occur at the end of the year. Um, and those two things combined are, are going to have a real impact um, in terms of um, uh, businesses um, in, in many of our communities. Um, I think we've seen in previous crises that the uh, particularly kind of independent firms um, are more vulnerable um, in these situations. Um, and there will be um, within within many of our communities businesses um, that unfortunately um, won't survive through this period, um, and so the the idea behind the guidance is to is to really serve as a um, it's a kind of introduction to encourage people to start thinking about how we might go about collecting um, the records um, that 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 um, kind of emerged during this period and how we might go go about documenting. Um, the, the businesses that um, uh, fall, fall victim um, to, the, to the economic circumstances. Um, so here hopefully you'll be able to see um, the link to the, the guidance that's now on, on the SCA website. Um, I'll just very quickly um, run through the contents. Um, hopefully you'll be able to download it and have a look for yourself. But, um, as I said, it, it serves very much as an introduction, and it's really, a, I suppose, it's a kind of means of starting um, a kind of conversation or, or thinking about these issues. Um, so it looks quickly at the the, the issue of um, uh, records at risk, the different kinds of insolvency that can occur, the different ways in which um, business records end up being um, at risk. Um, there is a section that discusses. Um, how to best uh, survey business records and how to monitor um, the, the kind of unfolding economic situation within um, your particular uh, community. 
and there's a brief step-by-step -step guide to um, the crisis management process um, and there's two um, excellent case studies uh, regard, um, in relation to Airdrie Savings Bank which um, Vibke McGee will, will speak about later this afternoon and um, Stoddart Templeton um, and I think most importantly there is a, there's a, a list of resources um, that is both um, resources that are, that are online and organisations that can assist um, with, uh, with crisis management and with, with collecting um, business records. Um, so we do very much encourage anyone who's, who is looking at um, collecting business records to, to get in contact with myself as the, the Business Archives Surveying Officer uh, and also with um, any other relevant organisations that are listed in the resources as there are, there are lots of people out there who are, are able to help and able to um, provide advice. Um, I think that's probably enough for me. I don't want to take up too much time um, because we've got um, uh, three uh, very interesting um, presentations to hear. So I'm going to just unshare my screen um, and I, I'd like to introduce um, the first speaker. Um, so first up we have um, Kristen Kinnamuth, who um, is an academic at Glasgow University. Um, and she is going to provide us with, a, with the perspective of, um, of the, the researcher um, on the importance of, um, of business records and of collecting business archives. So without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Kristen. Thanks very much. Yeah, Chris had really just asked me to speak to you from the academic point of view, as he said. And I started using archives, having not even done history at school, I must admit, um, when my supervisor at um, Paisley University, as it used to be, suggested for my fourth year dissertation looking at some of the brewing archives. I'd never looked at it before, but I was told there was a very nice lady called Alma who would help me um, find my way around cans and other such <laughs> items. And I guess a love affair with the archives um, ensued from that. And I went on to do my PhD um, looking at Giant P Coats Limited. I'm not sure, depending what people's backgrounds are, they may or may not know about that. And they are a, were one of the largest thread manufacturers in the world. And they were very early in terms of exporting, setting up, in America, Russia, etc. as well. So I essentially moved into the archives for about a year and a half, two years, and looked at many, many items. I was even allowed into the back, the hallowed halls behind, to see how much information there was. But actually one of the biggest issues from an academic point of view, is that what I believe to be there from the, from the actual catalogue, some of it wasn't there or it was miscatalogued, which not everyone, my background's in accounting, so not everyone understands maybe what some of these items are. But from an academic point of view, partly through your PhD to find out that you cannot access or these items don't actually exist in the way you thought they would, is rather terrifying, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, thankfully, my, my PhD supervisor steadied the ship slightly and we, we got through it. But it's, it's absolutely valuable, invaluable, I should say, to understand a company, really to look into its archives. Even if there's some recent histories and things like that. I would encourage anyone not to dismiss the older material as well because it just tells you so much. Um, my area is both accounting history and business history. So I look at particular companies like Giant P. Coates, um, Upper Clyde Shipbuilders, North British Locomotive, House of Fraser, various others but also broader business history as well. And being able to look at the archive, not just what's published, because you can, you can get that much more easily now than you used to be able to, 
but to actually look at the material as it was written at the time. So the account books behind the figures to understand where the key headline figures of assets, liabilities and other things came from is hugely important and the other thing that's really, really important is also being able to look at the minute books because you then get an impression, a far better impression of what was actually happening in the organisation in material that's published on, well, nowadays online or it used to be sent to shareholders many, many years ago. It was very much a sanitised version. We agree this. We have decided to do this. And it all sounds very good and well organised, etc., as you would want it to. But the reality is, and the interest really, is when you look at those minute books and see the arguments and the, the discussions and the disagreements, trying to decide what's best, what's not best. And that's not just from an accounting point of view. So although I think about it from a business and accounting point of view, even academics who are maybe looking at human resources or management or even ethics, even some um, broader things to do with um, environmental protection and what have you, that's all material they would find so, so interesting and so informative because it's where decisions were made. And when you can then support that on one side with the minute books and on the other side with the financial figures as well, you can really draw up a, a quite powerful picture of what was happening within the organisation. And yes, people do tend to think that, well, it's history or the company hasn't survived. Why should we be interested in it now? What can it tell us? And those of us that do history or have written and read about history know that most things come, come back around in a cycle. And if we can find out what went wrong with some of these organisations and industries, we should then be able to be in a better position to hopefully not make the same errors, if you like, or fall into the same traps as some of those companies did in the past. So from an academic point of view, it's incredibly powerful to have good archives, local archives and national archives as well. I teach at the University of Glasgow, so I'm fortunate that normally I'm just down the hill, although of course we're not allowed anywhere close to that hill just now. Um, but to have that on your doorstep is, is hugely important and you can have students come in and look at things, you can have dissertation students come in and look at things, I have a PhD student just now that's looking at things in the archives. She's doing a, a PhD on textiles in the Spanish speaking world. She has never done accounting or business before, but she's realised that she can't understand what was happening and the decisions that were taken without looking at the business records to try and get a background of what was happening. Because it's not just, although the records look at the company, when you look at the, the minute books and the other records, it gives you a much broader picture of what was actually happening politically, what was happening socially, what was happening economically, where competitors coming in perhaps from overseas, where uh, maybe a change in government has changed tax regulations. So even... Some people often think the financial records are only useful to people like myself, but actually they're hugely important to anyone looking at, at these kinds of broader issues as well to really get a sense of what was happening, not just in the company or the industry, but in the economy and politically as, and socially, as I say, as well. So I would be always chapping on companies' doors saying, please don't throw anything away. Even if you think it's too old or tatty or has bits missing, you can usually get something really, really powerful from, from the records that are there, but only if they're available, only if they're saved. Is really my thoughts on it, I think, Chris. 
That's great, Kirsten. Thanks very much. Um, or ask any questions. I think I'm just looking at the the Q and A just now. People can use the chat just, about. If there's anything that comes through, does anyone have any any questions they'd like to ask Kirsten? Um, I think while we're waiting for any questions to come through, I just I thought it was really interesting what you were saying um, about the importance of financial records because yeah. I think from the point of view of, of um, the archive profession, these these are of, often the kind of the most uh, problematic when it comes to business records. They they tend to be uh, quite great in volume, but um, yes. fairly impenetrable to anyone who doesn't understand. This is the problem, uh, and that's certainly what I found. And it's no fault of the archivist. You know, you thought there was perhaps a run of journals, but they were actually all just published profit and loss and balance sheets, which people probably had access to anyway. Um, but I know the archives, certainly in Thurso Street and more broadly, have been doing a lot to try and make sure those records are much more accurate and um, reflecting what's really there. But yeah, I think it probably just looks like a stack of often huge, physically huge books, but people can't imagine what they maybe want to say or how they'd be used. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, we've got one a uh, question in from, from Clea Hodgson, so um, it's more of a comment really. Um, so Clea says, from a, a records management point of view, keeping everything isn't practical, we can't tell businesses not to throw any way, anything away. Um, I suppose that kind of, that raises questions of yeah. um, within the business itself, there's obviously decision making around um, what to keep. Uh, and there's also decision making when it comes to the, to the point um, where you, you want to bring it into to an archive. Um, and, yeah. Sorry, Kristen, there you go. No, I was just going to say, I think what I would, again, I'm not an archivist, <laughs> so, um, but I, my only tip would be there, try and encourage businesses, if they are perhaps running out of stuff, particularly older businesses that have a lot of physically large, you know, the huge big leather bound volumes and things, to think about putting some of those into archives before it becomes a crisis situation. Because often when it becomes a crisis situation, either the company folding or they've run out of space, that's when things just perhaps get tossed out too quickly. And if they maybe think a little bit ahead, if they are in a position to, to think about what might be useful to save, but they don't necessarily want to keep it on site, that would be really helpful as well. But it is difficult. There's no unlimited space. There's not. Um, but there's a whole, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of accounting and business historians and we wouldn't be able to write about anything <laughs> if the material wasn't there. So um, just trying to encourage them to maybe make those choices earlier before it gets to a crisis it would probably be really helpful. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, please come back in just to say. Um, just to agree, I think, um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it is part of the, the records management program. Um, oh, we've got another question here. So how safe are the business archives that we used to think were secure? I'm thinking of companies like Motherwell Bridge, who seem to have destroyed their records despite them being registered in the NRAS. I don't know, are you able to comment on that, Kristen? I can't. Um, I can only imagine it would be a horrible situation and um, if you were thinking you were going to go in and look at items and then they're, they're not there um how how that situation would occur i don't know you're probably better uh, placed for that that sort of query chris than i am well i think um Vibke, um could maybe come in on this um can you, yeah can you hear me yeah Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, great. Um, yeah, yes. Um, when Mother Bro Motherwell Bridge um, closed down, um, the um, um, we were contacted by an employee employee of the company, and they handed a few things over to us. But uh, when you look at the list uh, that was on the NRAS um, and you see what survived, uh, you could just cry. Um, there was a book published for their centenary, and a lot of their records were digitized, and they are available on Scran. 
uh, and within that book, but uh, most of these records have not survived. But if anybody out there is interested to, to see what there is, if they contact me at uh, North Anglia Archives, um, I can let you know what has survived. Um, Great, yeah, thanks, Vivka. Um, we've got a question from Jim Brown. Um, it's not a problem regarding confidentiality when trying to get hold of accounting records. Some companies can be reluctant to release these. Is that something you've um, kind of come across? I had to actually contact companies. In fact, during my PhD, even um, although I had you know, as much access as I possibly could wish for in the archives, there were a couple of items where there was a physical note on it that the last surviving director must have must be contacted before you could access this. So I had I looked at hundreds and hundreds of, of items and then there was two or three pieces that we just were not allowed to access until um, written permission came from from the last surviving director and sometimes that can be for confidentiality sometimes that can be because particularly if it's a company i think that's collapsed people's feelings and emotions can be quite raw and they're quite worried maybe that you're going to look at it and you know maybe paint them in some kind of bad light maybe have they mismanaged have they overspent or things like that so there's definitely an issue there but when items are going into the archives i believe and again um Others could probably comment on this better than, than I, that companies do have the right to put these conditions on or say some items can be accessed now, some can't be accessed for five years, 10 years, whatever. I grew up initially with the 30 year rule, um, so things couldn't be accessed. So, you know, there are ways you can try and convince a company that certain items can be kept confidential. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think um, trust is really um, imperative when it comes to to the, the kind of relationship between the the collecting archivist and, and the business. There needs to be the trust there that that the material is going to be going to be handled with um, sensitivity. Yes, um, and be very worried. I know, um, and in the case of me, we actually had to go for a meeting with the the chap and discuss what we we're wanting to do, why we were wanting to do it and just really make him feel comfortable that it wasn't going to be some daily record <laughs> front page sensationalized story and that we were actually looking at doing a proper serious piece on his family's business. Great. Okay. Well, I think um, I know, Kristen, you've got to run off for another yeah. meeting at two. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's any more, more questions there. So um, at this time in a pandemic is not. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly been challenging. Um, so I'll try and hang around for five, uh, five, ten minutes just to hear some of the other speakers. But if I don't okay. say goodbye just now, everyone. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, um, Kristen, for joining us um, and for, for giving us that um, perspective from, um, from, from the academic world. That was really useful. Um, so uh, moving on to our next speaker, um, we have um, VP McGee from uh, North Lanarkshire Archives, um, who's going to um, tell us a little bit about her experience um, in the rescue of the records of Airdrie Savings Bank, um, which features as one of the um, the case studies within um, the, the, the guidance um, publication. So uh, I will hand over um, to Fibka. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll also try and say, um, share my screen here. Um, let's see whether that works. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, can you see? Yeah. Yep, that's, that's yeah. great. Oh, oh. I'll just um, enlarge this, which I didn't want to close this. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today about our experience with the Airdrie Savings Bank archives a few years ago. So as Chris said, my name is Vipke McGee and I'm the archivist for North Lanarkshire archives in uh, Motherwell. Um, give me a second. Of course, are we... Ah, am I using the right mouse? 
Ah, here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just using, I've got several sort of setups here because I can't use my work equipment to, to use Zoom. So I'm kind of just, um, I've got too many mice and uh, <laughs> keyboards and everything. So um, um, so here's the, the, the uh, structure of the short talk. So I've got a very brief introduction to our own archive, then um, a history of the ARG Savings Bank, um, just to put it into sort of um, context. And then um, I will talk a bit about the recovery of the uh, of the uh, air receiving bank uh, records in 2017 and then I will tell you a little bit about what is in the collection and um, also a little bit what uh, is not in the collection um, which um, is what Alison just mentioned as well regarding what you know you have a survey and then not everything survives later on um, so North Anglia Archives is a local authority archive based in Motherwell. Um, I've got a map here just for people who are not familiar with the local area. So um, I've got, I can open my point, my laser pointer. Yeah, so Motherwell is down here. Um, but um, we service the, the whole area of North Lanarkshire Council, uh, which includes towns such as Kilsyth and Cumbernauld in the north, and then uh, Coatbridge and Airdrie, the area known as the Monklands, uh, sort of in the middle. And then we've got Motherwell and Wishaw. Um, uh, towards the south and other sort of places one might have heard of are Shorts and Hart Hill along the M8 and uh, um, we also have Christ and Steps sort of more towards um, into Glasgow, East Dunbar and Sherway. Um, our collection uh, priorities are the records of North Lancashire Council and its predecessor administrations, so old borough records, um, a county records and so on, but we also collect private records of organizations, individuals and businesses in the geographical area. Um, and um, since we're talking about business records today, um, um, I just thought I'd let you know a little bit more about what kind of business records we have. So um, we have quite a number of collections and many of them are of structural engineering companies in the area such as Motherwell Bridge, the sort of rather diminished collection that sort of survived there. Um, Alexander Findlay, that's a, a very large collection um, of structural engineering works. They um, were involved in the Mulberry Pier Heads, for example, uh, or the, the White um, City Stadium for the London Olympics in 1908. Uh, uh, that's a, a great collection. Um, then we've got Thomas, Thomas Hudson, boiler makers, but also structural engineers. So that's quite a, a strong um, a part of our collection um, because of the industrial history of our area um, and but we also have collections of for example solicitors architects um, and um, we also have a large collection of um, anderson boys which is a motherwell company that um, produced cool cutting machinery uh, equipment and was a, was a leading uh, company in that field so in that context, um, when it was announced in January 2017 that the Airdrie Savings Bank was to close, we were immediately very interested uh, in any surviving records of uh, the, the, the bank, um, not just as a last example of an independent bank in the UK, um, but also because of its significance in the uh, history of, for the history of the town of, of Airdrie. And um, to illustrate this, I will give you just a very brief history maybe not quite so brief, but um, a briefish history of, um, um, of, the, of the bank. Uh, so the Airdrie Savings Bank was instituted in 1835 um, as the Airdrie Temperance Society Savings Bank. And it was formed by the efforts of four local men, um, the Reverend uh, John Kerslaw, Dr. William Clark, another reverend Andrew Ferry and James Knox and James Knox was a hat manufacturer who had come from Glasgow to set up business in Airdrie. So the first president was Dr. Clark and James Knox became uh, the managing director of the bank. Um, for over a hundred years uh, there was always a member of the Knox family um, as a, a manager, secretary or treasurer of the bank and this caused the bank to be known for many years also as Knox's bank. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about uh, the Knox family because they're so uh, um, connected to, you know, um, to, to the bank and uh, the, the wider uh, fabric of, of Airdrie really. Um, so you had James Knox, the first, uh, the founding member, he, and he was president in 1848 um, and he was imposed until 1861. And when he died in 1866, he was succeeded by his son, Walter. Um, and under Walter, the deposits more than doubled um, in the bank um, while he was in charge. Um, and he then recruited his own son, James Knox, who later became Sir James Knox, to be secretary of the bank. And that was when James Knox was only a teenager. Um, so this 
at <clears throat> James Knox later. Sir James Knox was a larger than life uh, figure, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Um, he was the driving force for the growth and development of the bank, and he was also one of Airdrie's best known worthies. So at 14, he began studying law at Glasgow University, and two years later, when his father died, he became manager of the hat business, and he became secretary, secretary of the Airdrie Savings Bank, in addition to continuing his studies. So then for the next 60 years, he pursued his career in the bank, being um, its manager for most of that period. He became a leading figure in the public life of Airdrie and later Lanarkshire too. I'm, I'm just men mentioning maybe his most distinguished posts, but uh, you, you get the picture when I mention them. Um, he was uh, a borough councillor. He later became provost of Airdrie. He was a justice of the peace. He was an honorary sherry substitute. He was a tax collector. He then became Lord Lieutenant of the County of Lanark and he was knighted in uh, 1932. And he was also a leading figure in organizations such as the Temperance Movement, the Airdrie Burns Club um, and the Lanarkshire Territorial Army Association. Um, and later in life, uh, the whole Knox family were always interested in local um, history. So later in life, he also pursued a literary career and he produced a number of books and articles on local and banking subjects. And most notably uh, his book, Airdrie, a historical sketch, and also the book, uh, The Triumph of Thrift, which was about the history of the Airdrie Savings Bank. So this James Knox was succeeded by his son, another Walter, in 1921. And, um, but Walter Knox's only son was killed in the Second World War. So when Walter died in 1954, he brought to an end uh, the Knox era. And at that point, um, the bank obviously had a first clear out. Um, and um, uh, many of our archives collections we have in the, um, about Airdrie, which we now um, uh, house in Motherwell, uh, came out of Airdrie Savings Bank um, as, and one collection is known as the, uh, as the Knox Collection, which is all his hist uh, local history, um, writings and scrapbooks and uh, uh, stories, they, they, you know, like oral history kind of in a way, uh, notes, um, stories they wrote, uh, the Knox family wrote down, and also uh, papers of organizations that um, James Knox in particular was involved in um, uh, during his lifetime. Um, so uh, on, on here, um, you can see uh, this is um, um, the, the headquarters and the, the, build, the building next door is the Airdrie um, Library. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that connection as well. So um, um, physically, um, the, the bank kind of had several uh, um, so headquarters, so to speak. So it operated out of uh, various premises. Um, um, uh, amongst them, for example, also the Knox's family hat manufacturers. Um, it moved to its first own premises in 21 Sterling Street in 1883, um, and the company remained there until 1895 when they moved to larger premises in uh, 28 Anderson Street, and that's this building here that's actually still in existence as well. So if you are an Airdrie, um, if you go up uh, this, this street here called Wellwind, at the top is Anderson Street, and you would find um, um, this building, um, this building there, which you can kind of see in the picture here, it says actually Airdrie Savings Bank. Um, <clears throat> then um, uh, a purpose-built permanent head office was built uh, on the corner of Wellwind and Sterling Street and opened in 1925. And this is this building here. And the bank at the time purchased a larger piece of land and donated the other piece of land to the borough of Airdrie to build Airdrie Library, which is this building here next door, which is still, uh, still the library, uh, the main library in Airdrie. Um, then the, the, uh, while the, uh, the, the bank expanded, um, they opened branches in uh, Coatbridge, Bells Hill, Shorts and Muirhead. And then later on, there were branches and sub-branches in uh, Gardkosh, Bayliston, Motherwell, Wifflet and Garnkirk. So the bank prospered uh, in the closing years of the 19th century as the result of coal mining and the heavy metal and engineering industries in its catchment areas. Um, and, uh, but the bank always operated on a mutual principles uh, mutual principles and had no shareholders and was uh, instead governed by a board of trustees. So these were generally local businessmen and women who were unpaid uh, in their roles. The bank always placed great importance on school saving schemes as well and took great interest in, in the community it served. So you can see that was the connection to the, um, um, to the library um, as well um, there. So the bank uh, survived a global financial, the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, um, and uh, but had to embark on a cost-cutting exercise. I do remember at the time that there was a feature uh, on the news how you know Airdrie Savings Bank was kind of held up as this 
great example of uh, how a bank could survive this crisis because they weren't involved in big risky um, uh, loan schemes and so on. But um, uh, and they they did uh, then in uh, 2011 celebrate their 175th uh, uh, birthday and uh, uh, commissioned a history to be written, which is Airdrie Savings Bank: A History by J uh, Charles W. Munn. But then, unfortunately. Um, um, in, in the wake of the financial crisis, so many um, restrictions uh, and additional requirements were placed onto banks that uh, um, the, the board of trustees of Airdrie Savings Bank resolved um, that the bank should be wound up um, because they just couldn't keep up with the cost of, of putting in all these uh, regulations. Um, and um, as I said before, it's, be, it's believed to be the last independent savings bank in the, um, in the UK. So, uh, so that was then in um, January, um, 2017, uh, when we started uh, engaging with the bank um, regarding their records. So on the 18th of January 2017, um, the news broke on the BBC that um, the, the Airdrie ba uh, Savings Bank was going to close. Uh, on the next day, um, we immediately contacted the um, bank surveying officer just to find out um, how, was this, had a survey been carried out before and um, did, did they know you know whether there were other archives that would be interested because obviously we were very interested to to take in any records that would have survived so uh, they pointed us um, first of all in the direction of the NRAS uh, survey from 1994 which had been uh, which was which was a bug survey um, and they also put us in touch with the archive of the Lloyd's TSB bank because um, Lloyd's uh, TSB were going to take on all the customers of the Airdrie Savings Bank, so we just didn't know how they would see themselves in, uh, as a successor in a way, or you know what would be the relationship and would they be interested in the records. So it was then established quite quickly that um, Lloyd's TSB were not interested in the records and uh, they put us then in touch with the um, chief executive of the, uh, of the bank, Rod Ashley, and um, um, that was, um, um, towards the end of January, beginning of, of February, and um, on the 10th of February, we, we started engaging more um, um, specifically with, with the bank regarding the records and also other artifacts um, that were, were, were on the premises. So um, just to kind of give you a bit of a feel, you know, is there a lot of time pressure or what happens uh, when you, you go in? Um, I then, we had arranged to go in on the 27th of February, but then I uh, had a family uh, emergency um, at that time and we had just had to put things on hold and that wasn't a problem. <laughs> um, you know, there wasn't a risk for, to, for records to disappear or something. They, they knew they still had a few months in the, um, in the building to sort themselves out and so on as well. So um, that kind of didn't um, cause any major problems uh, for us. So then in, uh, in April, um, we got back in touch and arranged to visit the bank for the first time at the end of April. And at that point, I went in with my colleague, um, Justin Parks, who is our industrial history curator. So he um, surveyed a lot of the objects. You can see some of them sort of dotted around here. So there's a trophy, for example. Um, and uh, also interestingly, left lots of paintings. And you can see this is actually James, um, um, no, Sir James Knox, and there's plenty of material regarding him. His whole Lord Lieutenant for the County of Lanark uniform was there um, as well, including um, um, the sword and uh, his hat and so on. And uh, um, so every corner you would find something about um, James. Um, uh, Sir James Knox, but you can see um, the records themselves were just dotted all over the place. There was really, um, when you go to, maybe if I go back, if you go into the, the we went, we were in this building, um, so the, the basement just runs all underneath this building, um, and that's where we spent a good three days uh, going through all the records, and every time we, we came back, you know, they had also tidied away some of the other records, what we were just talking about, records that might not survive in the archive. They obviously applied their own um, retention schedules, and disposed of things that they were required to dispose of um, as well in, at the same time. Um, um, another interesting um, uh, occurrence was one day we came in and said, oh, um, we just cleared away some filing cabinets and there they discovered a door behind those filing cabinets and there was another wee room uh, that had, nobody had remembered that this room existed and within that room we actually found several deed boxes of records of the 
a town, ERG Town Mission and the ERG Female Benevolent Society, which had been completely forgotten about for decades. Certainly the Buck survey didn't uh, survey them. So I think at that point, the filing cabinets were already, had already been so piled up um, um, uh, in front of that door. Um, yeah, so, so you can see um, how everything was, uh, you know, these are all kind of different rooms downstairs uh, in, the, in the bank. Um, and uh, we also spent quite a bit of time in the boardroom um, where they had kind of um, housed some of their kind of what they would have maybe considered their, their, their treasures um, um, as well. Um, so um, we had our own uh, van from the museum service um, and um, with colleagues from from the side team of Samali Museum um, and my colleague uh, Justin and I, we carried all the records out of the basement um, and, uh, uh, and then brought them over to the archives and the artifacts went to a Samali um, Museum. So, um, so what do we have now in this collection? <coughs> so that's um, the records um, on not on the shelf when they first came over. I have to say now we've, we've, we've stored the, the books um, in the outsized area and so on, but it was just before we started listing everything. We just tried to keep it as closely together as possible um, so we knew what we had. Um, so there are um, minute books um, from 1835 to 2006. There are annual reports. Um, there are a lot of rule books. They, they had um, a need to revise their, their rules constantly. You get the impression, <laughs> lots of rule books, some auditor report books, uh, many correspondence files, um, premises records, that's kind of title deeds, but also architectural drawings um, for, of, of not just of the headquarters, but also um, branch, uh, branch buildings. Then there's some stuff, salary books, um, there's uh, loans ledgers, that's kind of dealing with, with customers. Then uh, customer ledgers and signature books. Um, also some, some customer address books, uh, there's a few scrapbooks uh, with press cuttings and so on. There's a lot of souvenir booklets, um, things that they, they, they kept um, when they introduced their first um, um, cash machine, for example, um, there's uh, material around that. Um, 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 also of books about the bank's history and other, other uh, bank history, uh, histories of other sort of uh, savings banks. Uh, then there's many photographs of the branches and the directors. Um, there's items re uh, relate, and there's items relating to the ARG Public Library because you know that was obviously purchased. That land uh, was purchased by the by the um, by the bank. Um, and in addition, as I said before, we have the records of the ARG Town Mission uh, from 1846 to 1980 that was that were discovered, and also the records of the ARG Female Benevolent Society 1853 to 1974. Another collection that was already surveyed by the um, by the Business Archives Council we knew existed was the Broomnell uh, Church records, and they were initially returned to the church, um, and then they were transferred to the National Records of Scotland. So um, they have been saved as well. And then amongst all the the uh, other um, bank records, we also found a commu communicants rule book for the Southbridge Street United Free Church. So um, you never know what, what, what you find. And just one other thing I kind of uh, thought I would highlight, there was a, a box called um, the bank's historical relics uh, and they had material in it from 1839 to 1959. Um, and that included, uh, for example, um, a file of Knox Street Savings Bank, which was part of the ledger and the cash book used by James Knox at the age of 12 uh, when he was conducting a private bank at his grandmother's house. So um, uh, there's all kinds of um, uh, things in this collection, just not, not just for the history of banking, but uh, how a family, you know, that's about um, important families in the community, about how um, a mutual bank like this um, um, is connected to the welfare of, uh, of its town um, and the people of its town. So it's um, a fascinating collection and I hope there's um, some of you might be interested in exploring this a little bit uh, further, maybe for a, a project. Um, <coughs> um, so if you are, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, here's my email address and you can also follow us on Twitter. And here's a little savings, um, a little piggy bank from the savings bank um, um, as they really encouraged um, people to to, um, to be uh, thrifty and um, save them up their money and then bring it to the bank. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'm quite happy to answer. That's great. Thank you very much, Vipka. Um, 
we'll just maybe have a, just a, a couple of minutes quickly for for any questions. Um, so if anyone wants to, to pop a question into the into the Q and A, um, while we're waiting, I just I, the prerogative has been able to turn my one mic on and off. Um, I just wondered if, if you has there been any any use of the records so far? Has anyone has anyone been in to use them for for research since they arrived um, with you? No, not yet, because mainly because they are, even though they are listed, they're not properly catalogued yet, so we haven't advertised them uh, very much. Um, and also, um, you know, how pr priorities can change. Uh, so we were in the middle of listing them and we had a volunteer and so on, and then the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry uh, came uh, came with a request and uh, yeah, everything else had to be put on hold to, to look through, through records for that. So um, actually this was a welcome opportunity today to give this talk, to look at the collection again and uh, see where we are with this. And then I'm actually hopeful that we um, should be should be able to have a, a published catalog um, quite soon. So um, they haven't been used yet. Um, Apart from one, uh, actually, the the person who catalogued them has an interest in the Airdrie Observatory. So um, while they were cataloging, um, um, she was looking for information specifically for that as well, and she found a few things there. Hmm. Okay, so we've got one question in from from Martin Allen. So uh, he's asking, did you have to do much in the way of hmm. on-site appraisal or selection? Um, not too much, because basically the the company, the, the managing director, they directed us towards the, the, the historical records very much. We didn't have to, you know, go through a whole lot of mixed um, records. Um, um, and because we had the list from Bucks, we had sort of an um, idea of uh, what there was to find. Um, uh, so, um, no, we actually, we didn't um, have to do too, too much. Basically, uh, everything they kind of showed us that they had already identified as um, as uh, of interest um, uh, was of interest, and uh, and then when they found the room, you know that it was we, we had to have a closer look through the the records that were there, the um, Airdrie Town mission and uh, and the other. They had no idea what was in there, so we had to look through them. Uh, but again, it was uh, very quickly realized that they were great collections as well, and um, uh, and su supplemented some of the collection we already we already had um, for the for the Benevolent Society. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I'm very aware that time is time is marching on. So um, I'm just going to I think we maybe wrap up the questions for now. Um, there is the question and answer. I don't know maybe if you'd be if you'd be able to to type uh, yeah, an answer yeah. in just uh, for, for anyone that yeah. come in yeah. and with yeah. time at the end we can yeah, come so back I can do that. to them. Yeah. Um, okay. But for now, I just want to say thank you very much to you, Phil. That was a really fascinating yeah. um, uh, account of the the history and, and the process of rescuing the, the records from. Um, from what sounds like a really kind of uh, significant um, local financial institution. Um, so uh, now I'd like to move on to our last speaker, um, Fritz van Kempen from Tom, Thomas Miller. Um, I uh, first uh, met Fritz uh, only two years ago now, um, working on a rescue of records from the Scottish um, uh, Boat Owners uh, Mutual Insurance Association, uh, which is based up in Bucky. Um, so Fritz is going to tell you a little bit about um, how he came to be involved um, with that and um, hopefully provide a, a, a bit of a perspective on the whole question of um, rescuing business archives from a kind of a, a non-academic, non-archival um, uh, point of view. So um, I'll hand over to you Fritz, thanks very much. Oh, I think. Oh, there yeah. we go. That's Fritz. Yeah, so yes. And sorry. Uh, uh, hello. So my, as, as Chris said, my name is uh, Fritz van Kempen. I, I work for Thomas Miller. And Thomas Miller is a company in London that manages um, mutual insurance companies, uh, mainly in the maritime sector. Um, and we got involved in, in with, with Scottish boat owners, um, more or less, um, <clears throat> because the Scottish boat owners uh, was uh, facing some serious strategic issues. A bit like the, the, the earlier example, because of, of changes in the regulations that uh, didn't really favour smaller um, regulated uh, companies like uh, like the Scottish boat owners. Uh, in addition, they had a, a CEO who um, had clearly uh, whose own interests were not necessarily aligned with those of the policy holders or the members. And as a result, the PRA stepped in and um, 
did a detailed investigation in activities, found uh, evidence of mismanagement, um, and um, as a result, the board then uh, was forced to decide, um, actually the, the PRA decided actually on their behalf, but they, they clearly uh, uh, to uh, put the business in runoff. The PRA that is the currently still uh, investigating the former CEO, uh, it is well publicized if you uh, follow those matters in, in the press, it's still ongoing, but um, he um, was, uh, it is an interesting story, but um, uh, and he's, 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 he's contesting it, but uh, uh, um, and it will be subject to a, a final appeal later this year at some point. But anyway, the time when I um, came on the scene, the, the board had decided to put the company into runoff. They um, then clearly had difficulties in um, because the, their, their senior management team was implicated and uh, was, was forced to step down. Um, so they didn't have any one with insurance knowledge on the ground. So the PRA suggested that they seek help. And um, so the, the, the lady that actually was the factor of running um, uh, the, the mutual um, following the resignation of the CEO, then contacted Thomas Miller upon uh, a suggestion from the PRA and um, persuaded me to come to see um, the board uh, in Aberdeen. Uh, although, the, so they would all travel down to Aberdeen, I would fly up. Uh, we met in the offices of, 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 an, um, of, the, um, of, a, of a firm of solicitors. Um, they explained what, what the situation was and um, I, I then outlined what I saw as, as what were the options, um, and, um, and, and it, they had already started uh, the, the process of, of, of sort of um, liquidating some of the assets by appointing an auctioneer. But the, the, the real problem they had was what to do with the insurance liabilities, and that's where Thomas, where Thomas Miller stepped in. Um, so at that point, um, I then the demo the way and then pondered sort of my advice in inverted commas um, that took them about a number of weeks they then um, accepted that that a scheme of rates would be put in place and uh, thomas miller uh, was then selected to to help and assist uh, we put that scheme arrangement in place with the regulator it's all agreed uh, that uh, the, the the company would be uh, resolved and merged with another mutual insurance company uh, and therefore th that other insurance company would take on the liabilities of the um of, of the Scottish boat owners, thereby um, basically sort of um, <coughs> ending the, the Scottish boat owners as, a, as an entity uh, after almost 100 years, uh, which was really sad and still uh, is in my mind something that could have been avoided with, with the right management and the right um, people, but it, it wasn't to be. So at that point, if, if you don't take stock, so there are two things happening. One, the, the insurance liabilities, that was a plan, that, that was all uh, in, in, in train, that is, this is a court order, um, and it's, it's a long drawn out process, uh, but it is, it is just basically a an, 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 an well-known mechanism to transfer the liabilities from one insurance company to another. Um, the auctioneer had started to clear out the office, and um, so when I arrived on the first visit to Bucky, uh, the, the office was fairly bare, and the, the, the lady that was running the, uh, the, the what was left um, then it came to um, uh, show, show me around and there in the strong room she pointed to all those books and records and had uh, then uh, men and, and, and mentioned to me that the auctioneer thought this was a very interesting um, collection and there was strong demand for pups uh, from pups in Australia to line their walls with those old leather bound books at that point I sort of raised my eyebrows and said well um, these are historical records um, the, 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 the Scottish boat owners is a uh, mutual insurance company that was formed um, by the local um, um, fishermen for the local fishermen. It, it fulfilled a, a proper function here. Would it not be much better to find a local archive to take um, 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 ownership of, of these records and then uh, preserve them for 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 for, for posterity? So you see, then sort of. Uh, was a bit wary, he said, Ooh, but if we do that, then people, uh, she was very worried about confidentiality, that people could, uh, could find out how much the, their, their colleagues had been paid. I said, well, I think there are two things. You can separate probably though, those records from, from, from other records. Uh, but I mean, the historic, the, there must be an historic interest in those records. So she, she was still umming and eyeing, and then I, I decided to do a bit of digging on my, on my own. And lo and behold, with, without too much effort, I, I managed to find Chris's email address. Um, when I was back in London, uh, and contacted him um, with the suggestion that um, 
there might be records that may have interest to uh, to someone uh, like like him. I think he then contacted me. Uh, he then suggested there was some, something like I think it's what's called the rapid response team, um, and that once again uh, when I mentioned that to uh, the, the lady that was running the, um, the, the managing the office. Uh, got her in, com in a complete blind panic because she was imagining that we are going to be jack booted a, a man showing up at six o'clock in the morning, kicking the doors in to take the records away. Uh, it turned out to be, it took a little bit longer that, than, than one sort of dawn rate to take the records away. But um, once I had persuaded her that um, she would get sufficient to notice to, to meet Chris and his team, uh, and there was nothing going to be sort of uh, taken away uh, without her knowing it, she became very cooperative and uh, understood that um, we were not interested in selling those um, records to Australian pubs for to maximize our um, sort of financial gain from this transaction. Um, and then I think Chris took over from there, so I, I wasn't really involved then uh, from that point onwards, and it, it took a number of attempts to find the right um, um, place for those records, and I understand that they are now going to be uh, located at the um, um, Maritime Museum in Greenwich, which is probably a very, a very good place. Um, and when I mentioned it the other day, uh, when I learned about this to, to that lady, uh, she was also actually rather uh, pleased with, with that outcome. <coughs> and then if we then move on to um, the fact that had I not been there, and uh, had, had I been an administrator or liquidator of a company, um, then the, the, those records would probably have been uh, ended up uh, with an Australian pub, uh, because uh, the, the, those people have a duty to maximize the the the, um, the, the, the return to, um, they have a fiduciary duty to their uh, creditors, and therefore they need to liquidate as many assets as possible, so they can uh, maximize the return to those creditors. Um, so in, in my mind, therefore, what, what this, and, uh, well, uh, in, in the first instance, when, when Chris uh, approached me, he told me how difficult it was to find an, um, an, 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 an insolvency petitioner or, or an uh, administrator to, uh, willing to talk to, to you here about uh, preserving historical records. Uh, and, and in my mind, it is uh, very simple. They are actually not interested in it because it, is, it, 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 it doesn't tally with their um, fiduciary duty to uh, creditors to maximize their return to them. So what I would think you need is an early warning system when things are going to go wrong. So before those people are appointed, uh, and therefore um, you need to work in my mind um, with the local business community um, and, and find a way that sort of uh, you, you get a an, an, an tip off, if you will, before an, a company uh, um, or, or a bank or, or a court appoints the, um, the administrator or liquidator so that you can actually work um, in advance of, 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 of a company going under uh, what to do with those, those records and agree that, that they can be sort of uh, donated uh, to, uh, to those archives instead of being sold um, for um, as decors in Australian pubs. Um, and my own observation on how best to go about doing this is the following. Um, and then I realized in, in, in Bucky, it's, it's, and I think like many, like in many other towns in, in Scotland, um, the local business community does meet regularly in, in groups like the Rotary, the, uh, the Lions, or even the Freemasons. And um, it was also clear uh, from, from the process uh, I went through that, um, for example, when it came to selling the building, that this was something that had already agreed a long time before I came on the scene uh, uh, at, at a uh, Rotary meeting who's going to uh, be allowed to bid for that building. So no matter what, how hard I tried, uh, it was clear that uh, the building was going to end up with this particular firm of accountants uh, through that Rotary co connection. So that, that is a negative side of that system. The positive side is they, are, they, they do meet regularly. They, and you can see it uh, if you go to any the local hotels, whether the Rotary meets on Tuesday, the, the, um, the Lions meet on Wednesday, and the um, Freemasons meet next door in, in, in their, their hall. So I suggest that, that you, if, you, if you want to set up an early warning system, you try to establish and also maintain contact with that local business community through those organizations. They often have a charitable purpose. They, they like to do and be seen to be doing something for the local community. So if you could, for, for example, organize an annual lecture uh, about uh, what, what the Scottish Archives or, or, or your, your organization does 
or uh, would like to do, um, that might well be of interest to them. And then maintain that relationship by sort of getting them, to, for example, to sponsor or, or, or a, a local exhibition about the results of your research and, and or the, the things that are in your archives. So that an, a wider group, uh, in, in, for example, in, in the local library can, can share um, the benefits and see what, 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 what has, been, um, uh, has been done uh, by, by rescuing those, those records. So these are just my, my, my thoughts. This is very simple. It's not, not really compact. And, and I, as I say, I, I'm not involved in, in, in preserving records as, as such. My, my main role is to, um, to manage mutual insurance companies. But as, as an outsider, I'm more than happy to take any questions um, if, you, if you have them. That's great. Thank you very much, Fritz. That was a, that was a really interesting account of um, what happens with, uh, with the Scottish boat owners and um, some really invaluable um, observations. Um, I think it was very useful to particularly a lot of um, uh, local archivists. Um, so I realise now that we are we are slightly over, um, but hopefully people were, are, are happy to kind of hang about for a few more minutes and we can we can see if there's any um, any further questions. Um, uh, or any questions for, for Fritz. So I'll just keep a, an eye on the, um, on the Q&A and see if anything comes in. Um, so we've had something previously from, from Koya and Bramsky uh, asking about um, legislation um, that obliges private companies to deposit their archives in state repositories and obliges the government to step in with financial and logistical support to rescue archives of, of failed and, and failing companies. Um, I mean, I, I suppose that's, that is something that um, in, 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 the, in the kind of scenarios that, that you outlined, Fritz, where IPs are reluctant to, um, to have anything to do with preserving historical records because yeah. of their responsibility to creditors that um, perhaps uh, if they were compelled, uh, then then that would be a that would be a different. Um... There, there, there is a, there is actually a, a good analogy in the in, in the current Companies Act, where companies are obliged to take into account all the interests of stakeholders, not only shareholders. So it, it wouldn't actually be too difficult to introduce a similar concept, say in, in the Insolvency Act, by by saying that when it comes to um, the records and and the other. Um, um, Interest of, of items of historical interest, they should take those into consideration. So, but currently the, the the problem is the other way around. Companies are only obliged to keep records for say six years. So um, I think we we heard earlier in the in the previous case study that companies have their own sort of um, um, disposal uh, schedules, and um, because of 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 space uh, restrictions, uh, a lot of companies do indeed discard all records after six years. So that in, in, another way then is actually um, get, um, in, instead of um, waiting till the company goes under, um, approach companies of interest um, and, and then instead of um, them checking those records and shredding them, um, suggest that you get a first look in um, and then you, you've got a rolling sort of collection of records, which is probably easier to, to deal with than one big uh, chunk at the end of, of, of a company's life. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think you can you can particularly appeal when it comes to um, uh, slightly larger businesses to, to notions around corporate social responsibility and so on to um, to kind of appeal to the to better natures of the business to to, um, to take into account the historical yeah, but, but also, also if you do it when they, when they consider their rolling disposals, at that point there is no risk that any of the directors because the, the problem is if they don't maximise the value um, at at the end, then they could be sort of um, seen to be um, breaching their fiduciary duties, uh, and therefore that, that they, they they just only focus like a razor on, on, on maximizing cash. If if you get in early when when you deal when they're dealing with their normal disposals, um, at that point it's a cost to them uh, by getting rid of those uh, and, and shredding those those records. If you take them off their hands, um, you actually uh, help them save costs. So it is, an, an, uh, I think there's a benefit to be had to to en engage with them during the normal review process of, 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 of their um, records. That's a really good point. Thanks, Fritz. Um, we've got one more uh, question that's come in. It's more of a kind of general question from Samantha, uh, who's asking how do we do this when our own jobs are um, being affected 
Um, and local government archives come four months further with another threat, and despite intensive advocacy efforts of several years, the archives itself has been compri um, compromised by a lack of staff during COVID, so to rescue records is enormously difficult. Um, I think, yeah, that is an issue that is going to affect um, a lot of local archivists, and um, hopefully one of the things the guidance um, can provide is a, a kind of um, some direction towards resources and organisations that are able to, to assist in this. Um, my role um, as a surveying officer um, allows me to, to provide assistance um, in these kind of matters, so I'm happy to, to discuss any issues with anyone who, um, who needs any, any kind of practical help. And of course, we do have the, um, the UK-wide crisis management team, um, which has been, has been working um, hard over the last few months to, um, to, to be, be prepared for what, what we predict to be a, a wave of business closures. And we have a team of volunteers that have signed up to, to do the kind of practical tasks like surveys and, and going out to businesses um, and, and so on. Um, Vipka, do you have anything that you would, you would add to that? Because obviously that's, um, that's very much in, in, your, in your remit. Um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult because obviously if you're on furlough, then you're not allowed to do any work. So um, um, apart from maybe training or you would have to um, speak to your, I mean, one thing, of course, if, if something did come up and uh, um, there was a way of contacting the local authority archivist um, and there was a particularly significant collection, it would be possible for the archivist to make a case to kind of say this is uh, um, to, to be unfurloughed for at least... A certain period of time but it really is uh, money is so tight everywhere um, you it would have to be something particularly special I think for for that to happen uh, I would guess it probably would be worth trying but um, um, yeah it's it, it would be up to um, um, people higher up and the financial situation um, <clears throat> Great. Um, so we've got one more person that come in. So I, as I said, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we're, we're kind of approaching 10 minutes over, over schedule and people will have other things to go on to this afternoon. So we'll maybe just finish with, with this one. It's from um, Elna Carter, uh, just asking how can, we, how can we anticipate which organisations might be at risk? Are there any frameworks we could apply to monitor the climate and how to best respond when a crisis response is needed? Um, and then um, Elena refers to the Family uh, Planning Association going under. Um, I don't know if anyone else in the panel has any thoughts, but I think uh, this, this is a really good question. Um, and it's definitely something that um, has been an issue. It isn't always possible to predict um, when an organization um, is going to collapse. But I think as a general rule of thumb, um, one of the things that um, we're hopefully encouraging um, local archivists to think about, and obviously understand that this is, can be quite a resource intensive process. But again, as I said, there are, there are people out there who can help with this is to, is to consider doing um, even very, very kind of um, high level audits of the business uh, um, kind of community within your collecting remit to try and identify the organizations um, that you would like to collect records from uh, in, the, in the event that the, their records were, were, were at risk. And I think, like, again, going back to the point that Fritz made um, about having those local connections with um, business organisations like the Rotary Club and the Lions and so on um, is a really good way of having your ear to the ground um, and getting the kind of the, uh, an early warning um, if, uh, of any businesses that are, that are in trouble. Um, I don't know, is there, is there anything you would add to that, Vipka or, or Fritz? Um, no, I, I'm not a member of those organisations myself, but I, mean, I have noticed that they are everywhere in Scotland and they are clearly, um, they do meet regularly, so any and they do gossip. So it, it is, um, in my mind, indeed the best way to get an early warning. But as I say, I, I think I'm suggesting that you actually do your homework first and work out which ones you really want to get involved with so that, but that once a tip-off comes that you are ready um, is actually, in my mind, makes sense too. Great. Okay. Um, well, I think I think we'll, um, we'll wrap it up there, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I'd just like to say um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for attending the event this afternoon. Um, and I hope you'll go um, to the SCA website and and download the the guidance and have a look. And then um, please do um, get in touch if you have any any further uh, questions or if you have um, any ideas about um, around kind of collecting uh, business records that you that you'd like to discuss. Um, I suppose the last thing to do is just to say um, thank you very much again to. 
uh, our speakers, um, Kirsten, Luca and Fritz. Um, they're all really, really um, great presentations and, and provided um, lots of different perspectives on, on what's uh, a complex but um, very uh, current issue. Um, and thanks again to the SCA um, for, for hosting um, and um, for supporting um, this initiative. Um, so thanks everyone and uh, hope you all have a, a good afternoon.